season two, it's 8.30, season two. I'm live. I hope Dr. Massaquay is. Welcome to <laughs> 30 at 9 p.m. I mean, so Natisha, could you, production, could you have her call in? Thanks. Hi, Janelle. Hi, Upala. Hanging in there. Thank you so much. <laughs> Comical now. Okay, so. Production, not sure what you mean by that. There's something up with Instagram. Okay. Yeah, yeah, think production. There's production said, Crimp Community production said, there's something up with Instagram. Yeah, think. I was just, okay. You know what? That's. That's funny. You got jokes this evening. All right. One more time. Oh, oh my gosh. Can I? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I'm back. Oh, there it is. Oh, She's back. Is. Oh, okay. Just don't move. I don't know. Don't breathe. Don't. Okay. <laughs> All right. The crib community's still here. Holding for on for hope. <laughs> We're gonna do it. <laughs> you look fabulous. Thank you so much. I did the introduction. I don't know if you heard it. I I did. Okay. All right. So we're just gonna we're just gonna dive right in. Yes. Absolutely. I have been to every room in my house. I have employed every family member. We we are we're re we're ready. We're we're ready right. to go. It's like when you have that cell phone and you're like. Do I have a, do I have a signal now? <laughs> this is insane. That crib community, and thank you for chiming in to Problem Solve as well. Production, thank you so much. We are going to take a deeper dive. I'm very excited to finally have Dr. Massacoy join 30 at 830. Well, now it's 30 at 9 o'clock. Um, <laughs> <laughs> series. Um, and I titled this particular episode, The Other Pandemic, um, which people might say, huh? What do you mean by other? And that's exactly the point, that we have othered, we have swept aside, cast aside, put it underneath the table, out the door, out the window, and not even uncovered or begun to unpack the issues of systemic anti-Black racism. We've often othered it or left it on the side. And at this moment in time, it appears as though it is front and center and so tonight, this evening with Dr. Massapoy, who I've had several candid conversations with about anti-Black racism, both here in Canada and the U.S., we're going to begin to sort of unpack some of that, if you will. So I'm going to just have at it. So I remember when I first moved here and to Canada, and I began to have conversations about the development of the crib. I was taken aback a little uh, by people's reaction relevant to the use of the word black in the title of the center or the discomfort that people seem to be experiencing when talking specifically about anti-black racism. And you were very, very helpful in helping to unpack the covert and over tensions that exist here in Canada relevant to anti-Black racism. So as we move through our conversation this evening, I think it might be helpful for us to lay a foundation of understanding, if you will, a shared foundation of understanding. So Dr. Massacre, what is anti-Black racism? Wow. And do you want a Canadian context or <laughs> a Natisha Massacoy context? I, want, I mean, can I, have, can I have both? Can I have both? Absolutely. I mean, when we when we look at the the basics of anti-black racism, it's the disadvantaging of a group of people solely solely based on the color of their skin, and very specifically. When we talk about anti-Black racism, we're talking about the treatment and the disadvantage, the disproportionality that is created 
for the experiences of black people mm -hmm. specifically in a Canadian context. Mm -hmm. So for me, anti-black racism is about looking at disparity and disproportionality of experiences yes. that black people are having specifically mm -hmm. in, in a cultural context. And in this case, mm -hmm. we're talking about Canada. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're gonna get into it because you and I, I, have, I, 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 hope, I hope that was worth the wait. I hope that was worth the wait. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So how does anti-Black racism manifest in Canada, the land, if you will, of the freer versus the U.S., the land of the free? And let me just stop there because you can speak to other contexts, I know, because of your social location. But let's just parcel that out. The land of the freer can it Canada and the land of the free in the U.S. And you know why I'm saying these things as well. So please. Yeah, how it manifests in, in Canada is is a state of denial and invisibility. Mm -hmm. And what you have in a Canadian context, which is very different than an American context, for example, is the fact that systemic racism is so pronounced, it is so practiced that it has become normalized and invisible mm -hmm. to the perpetrators specifically. And when we talk about what does anti-black racism look like in Canada, it starts with the fact of the denial of slavery and that, that is at the core. Mm -hmm. So the denial that there was a system of slavery in Canada, that Canada is built on the labor, the free labor of slaves, mm. and that black people have been in Canada since the beginning or the arrival of the colonizers. They came with the colonizers. I always have this joke that Canadian history wants us to believe that the British and French arrived here and they left their slaves at home. <laughs> they didn't bring them. Right, right, right. right? They came here annihilated indigenous communities, carried their own bags, cut down all the brush and trees that needed to be cut down to clear this land that they, they wanted to claim and did so without their slaves. Mm, mm, mm. You know, it's interesting. I, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. It's interesting as you, you know, we've talked about this number, number of times offline, but I was watching CNN and then, um, and uh, MSNBC today, uh, and they were interviewing um, some folks, <laughs> some folks who are in political leadership. And, you know, it, it's not a far cry from what you're describing. It's not a far cry from what you're describing. Literally today, folks were saying basically that they don't believe that anti-Black racism or, black, or racism, structural racism exists essentially that there are biases and discrimination, but that's not really a part of structural racism. And so that is really why I wanted to start with this today's conversation with a fundamental understanding of a definition of what it is and understanding that it exists because there are real individuals in positions of power who are denying, denying its existence, period, full stop. And that's, that's, part of the root of, of the problem. So thank you for that. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, we're uh, still holding on to the, the fantasy that, you know, Canada solely is the end point of the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's where the history of Black people starts in this country. Mm -hmm. But you've had to erase 400 years prior to that. And they, they've done that very successfully in the Canadian education system and within the psyche of, of Canadians. But I mean, we'll go on and, and talk some more wow. um, because what we, we've had through that denial is the inability for there to be any conversation about reparations or restitution or mm -hmm. to actually look at how systems of oppression specifically targeting black people have been developed in the Canadian context. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, oh I, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I've got something there, but I'm gonna hold it. I'm gonna hold it in the parking lot. So, so how does, with that understanding, how does the manifestation of anti-black racism divide us? How does it divide us when we talk about systems? When we talk about the penetration uh, into different structures, how, how does it divide us? 
How does it divide black people or how does it divide? How does it divide black people? How does it divide us as a people within a country possibly trying to, to, to address issues of social justice? How does it divide us? Absolutely. Um, well, first and foremost, if we look at society as a whole, what, what's happening right now is a moment where people are seeing the response, black, black people responding en masse mm. to the oppression that we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're seeing people take to the streets. It's not the first time that this has happened in any way. Right? We've been seeing this since, since, since the beginning of arrival, right? We've been seeing yeah. black people uprise. But for the first time, it seems that white communities on a whole are watching it and seeing, oh, something is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I always say the issue that divides us is the fact that because it's been made so invisible to white society for so long, mm -hmm. what they end up seeing are just our responses, which look violent to them. That's right. But they're not That's seeing right. what has built up. They haven't seen the build up. That's right. That's right. right. So the responses that you're seeing now are the extreme responses to extreme forms of racism and oppression that we're experiencing. Yes. Um, yeah. I was recently talking to or interviewed and I was saying, you know, racism is traumatic. It's trauma. And so what you're seeing is unchecked, unnoticed. Uh, un un unacknowledged grief and trauma and loss after loss, right? Uh, that that that's 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 spilling, but that, that just is, has reached its capacity, its of containment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're seeing you're seeing a very normal reaction to an abnormal, ignore, abnormal experience mm -hmm. that a group of people are having, but we're having a very normal reaction. Mm -hmm. um, and so the inability for communities to understand that normal reaction is what's dividing us, I believe. Yeah. Um, I mean, internally within our communities, because we have so much, um, you know, differences of opinion on how we should express tell rage, it. grief, anger. Tell it. Tell it. You know, that, that's, that's, a, that's, another, that's another dividing point. And that's, that's an internal conversation, but... But still, you know, we, we have so many different opinions on how we are supposed to express mm. this. Mm. Um, and right now, I think we have to just allow the expression to happen in whatever form it comes. Because if we do not release that rage, anger, grief, pain, uh, I, I can't see how we're going to move forward as a community. Patricia, thank you. Thank you, thank you. What we are seeing is a normal reaction to something that is abnormal. Thank you for saying that. Just thank you for saying that. Just, oh my gosh, got goosebumps. Um, so with this sort of understanding, if you will, how might efforts to address anti-Black racism and, and allowing for the feelings and the grief to show up and manifest itself or, or uh, in, in all forms of expression when we accept it, how might those efforts to address and accept the grief and the loss and the trauma, how might that bring us together? I, I think, um, you know, from, I, I come out of health, healthcare. A lot of my work has been in healthcare. And so, what I get to see is specifically when working with black communities is the impact of when we don't get to express that grief and anger and, and pain. And if we don't have a release, what we see is overrepresented, our overrepresentation in stress related illnesses, diabetes, heart yep. disease, yes. right? Hypertension, uh, depression. All, all, of, all of those things are, are direct manifestations of the experience of extreme forms of anti-Black racism mm -hmm. and what the result is for us physically and, and mentally as a, as a people. And so I think we have to come together mm -hmm. as, as a community. And, you know, we're always, I always get corrected. It's like we're multiple communities. And I say, you know what, for strategic uh, politicalness right now, we need to be a community. 
and we need to understand. <laughs> Absolutely, this is this is about the community yes. of Black people, and we need to understand that no matter where we are in the world, mm. I could go and look at health outcomes in Brazil. I could go look at our health outcomes in the Caribbean, right? I can go to the U.S., I can go to Europe, U.K., Canada. They will be exactly the same, right? We're seeing it with COVID right now. Exactly, exactly. Overrepresentation of Black people in a pandemic. We could look at the HIV pandemic. Overrepresentation of Black people no matter where we are in the world, outside of Africa, so in the Black diaspora, we will see the manifestations on our bodies, mm. our mental health, our minds, our spirits, yeah. our spirits, all of those things will be impacted the same way, no matter where we live in the diaspora. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is indeed a pandemic. It is indeed. So since season one, our global community has witnessed the murder of George Floyd local rap artist Houdini, the shooting of Jacob Blake, and countless others whose names and faces will never make the headlines. And if I'm honest with you, Natisha, I struggle with being relieved, perhaps even grateful, that the conversation of anti-Black racism has gained global visibility while being challenged by the fact that it took us this long to get here. I struggle. While countless lives continue to be lost and the mental and physical labor of our communities compromised, it seems as though the world has started to wake up to the realities of Black people attempting to disproportionately survive the intersection, intersecting realities of COVID-19 and the continued assault of the other pandemic, anti-Black racism. But so what, what do you think has contributed to this fundamental paradigm shift or this elevated discourse, if you will, in helping to understand the chronic impact of anti-Black racism on the lives of Black people? I know. Yeah, I know. yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot. I know, and, and I, I have to come with a big answer because I made you wait for so long. But, um, you know, first and foremost, the thing that I'm grappling with is how it has become normal to watch the murder of a Black person on TV, on a regular basis, televised, daily, social media, any time of the day, 24 hours a day. And how do you not think that that's going to impact and further traumatize Black people who have been experiencing this their entire lives? George Floyd is not the first. He's not the first, but he might be the first where we've watched an entire murder. Say it. Say to the it. point where a man is, is begging for his life, yeah. calling for his dead mother, and we watch the callousness of someone with their hand in their pocket and knee on neck. Um, and no one is questioning why do we have to watch this on a regular basis? Black people are the only race of people where we can watch our murders on TV on a regular basis. And now we have social media added to this. Um, you know, what? what's the only thing that's different at this point in time is that it coincided with another pandemic, which is COVID, where people were isolated and had to watch. Thank you. But there is no other just there is no other distraction. Um, but I, I, I think also, you know, we have to look at the fact that it was the stance of that police officer representing white supremacy and white people for the first time got to see the eyes of someone engaging in white supremacy. And you can't tell me you didn't look at that and have to reflect on who you were as a white individual. I mean, we weren't necessarily looking at that white officer. We were looking at George Floyd and reflecting on the fact that that could be me. That could be my son. That could be my child. That could be my brother. Um, but you have to think about what were white people looking at when they were watching that video. We also have to think about the women who've been killed. Breonna Taylor, 
in Canada, Regis Karchensky Paquette, Chantelle Moore. Um, and you know what what does that mean be, in terms of gender based mm. violence? We are we are not safe. We are not safe in any way yeah. from police, law enforcement, and these are the people who we are supposed to believe will protect us. Um, so, you know, we can't, I, I think what's happened in this moment is that we can't get away from this, this argument. We can't, uh, we can't ignore the statistics. We just saw the Human Rights Commission report that came out for the city of Toronto. A black person is 20 times more likely to be killed by a Toronto police officer uh, than any other race of people. And in fact, when we say things like it's worse in the States, right? We use the George Floyd example to say it's worse in the States. The city of Toronto and its policing of black people and the murders of black people by the police is at the ex exact same level as any major U.S. city. Mm -hmm. um, and we just saw that report come out. And the racism, what looks different in Canada is not just the murder of black people by the police, but the nuances of the engagement with the police. So things like we are overrepresented in the number of sort of petty crimes we're picked up for. Mm -hmm. So stop and frisk, so, yeah. stop and frisk uh, marijuana possession, uh, what we call small, small, small minor infractions, but we're overrepresented in the people who are released or no charge followed through on, meaning that you're indiscriminately rounding up black people. You don't have a reason to do it. You don't have proper evidence. And at a rate of 51%, we're let go, uh, which is an interesting dynamic. Um, it talks about how we are policed in a very particular way in Toronto. Yeah. You know, as you're talking, it, it really, it just reminds me of, again, some of the conversations we've had, particularly relevant to individuals, this understanding that we're connected. We're so connected in terms of Black people, we're connected in terms of having this, this sort of, um, collective trauma, this, this connectedness as a people uh, uh, who are survivors, who are literally uh, traumatized, whether it's by homicide, gun violence, police brutality, all of those combined and however space and place that they happen, whether it's US or Canada, that, that there is this global community of black survivors who are really struggling to make sense out of that which is senseless but also have compromised as a result have compromised mental health and health outcomes and and that that is that is why it is a pandemic that is exactly why it's a pandemic so thank you so much for breaking that down so precisely and, and concisely love it oh, i'm sorry i just got goosebumps okay sorry okay i gotta i gotta keep going though so all right so in our discussion this evening we've established a shared understanding of anti-black racism and its impact on our global community. But I wanna shift, I wanna shift for a moment to social action. Sort of the, the, the bread and butter, the foundation of social work, if you will, yes? That we've been seeing through social media and protest, uh, boots on the ground work, if you will. So in short, Natisha, and I think you've touched upon this, or Dr. Massaflay, why do we march? Why do we march? Why do we protest? And you've talked about it a little bit, but why do we protest? You know, the one thing we don't talk about is the need for a release. The need for right? release. Right, the need, the, mm -hmm. it's, it's therapeutic. It's therapeutic okay. to be uh, in the company of- Your voice is a little tinny. I can still hear you and see you, thank goodness. Just want to let you know it's a little tinny. Okay. okay. Um, but there, there is a need for release. There is a need for me to leave my home and join with people who are like-minded in terms of our need to address oppression. But the thing is, to eliminate anti-Black racism, several things have to happen. One is disruption. Mm. There has to be an overturning of the oppressive system. Mm -hmm. There has to be also a reconstruction and I always talk about these three phases. Mm -hmm. Disruption is extremely 
extremely important. And many of us often get nervous with the disruption, the protest, the, the what is seen as you know not respectable in terms of you know political positioning. But disruption is very important. A, it rings the alarm. It tells us there's something wrong. It tells us that people are upset. It tells us what the problem is. It highlights what the problem is. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's about holding people accountable. Mm -hmm. The overturning is the piece where we, we have to engage in removing or dismantling the system that is oppressing us. Mm -hmm. The last piece that we often ignore is the reconstruction, because mm -hmm. after I ask the place, who's going to build it back, right? Yeah, yeah. Who, who, who actually is going to participate in the reconstruction phase? Oftentimes in our communities, there's a division between those three groups of people. Some of us are good at all three. Yes. Some yeah. of us are very good at all three. Not many. Some. Um, but that's why we have to work collectively to answer an earlier question. That's why we have to move collectively. We need all three of those groups of people to work together. And I, I think we have to really start start doing that now. Yeah. The 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 catchphrase that plays in my mind is like the protest without purpose and strategy, both short and long term, is pointless. Period, full stop. Like it's just, it's gotta be, yes, there has to be this release. There has to be this mobilization, but we've got to be critical and strategic about what what is the pathway forward and how do we lay that foundation to again have true reform that address issues of social injustice. I, I, I agree, hundred percent, a hundred percent. The interesting thing, and you and I have talked about this too, with protesting is again as we're sitting at home, social distancing. Um, you know, we've been we we have a front row seat. We have a front row seat in terms of you know 90 days of protesting in Portland. Uh, I was I was three blocks away from the process that took place when Freddie Gray was murdered, and trying to then explain to people what that protesting was about. But then I often um, came up against right conversation um, about other protests that were taking place. For example, individuals who are carrying AK-47s spitting in the face of the police, there's no sort of, the, the response or retaliation is somewhat different. And somehow we're still not able to understand in our struggle, in our efforts to address social justice by protesting, that there's still the structural anti-Black racism that permeates even that. Even as you so eloquently put our ability to 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 let it out to to right so what, what is that what, what, to, to talk, let's talk about that <laughs> let's talk about that <laughs> yeah uh i i mean you know we it, it, it's a it's a bit of a i mean i can just basically say anti-black racism still exists and it's going to exist in how how one even gets to protest, who gets to protest, and how how we get to protest, and who, who gets to walk out safely from a protest. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that we don't have a lot of experience with in a Canadian context is guns, mm -hmm. that you can walk freely with a gun, that you can yeah. Yeah. show up with an AK-47, and, and that's part of, you know, what you, you your, your tools of protest. So, you know, I can't speak to that culture. Right. Um, right. That that is something that I'm a, a a bystander and a voyeur to, but what it does speak to is what is called rebellion, mm -hmm. what is called a peaceful protest, mm -hmm. what is called mob violence. You know, yeah. we have different language. You know, when the 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 I can't remember the the group, but they had the tiki torches and they were yes yes yeah and they got. Right. And, you you know, you, you have a president saying there are good people on both sides of, of that situation. Right. 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 right? So you, you still have people looking at, you know, white supremacist mm -hmm. disruption as good people standing up for their rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then when they flip that to look at black people doing the exact same thing. Right. It's a violent mob. These people must be jailed. They must be arrested. They must be stopped. They, you know, all, all of the things that that happens. So, you know, I, I think it speaks to the depth of 
the oppression that we experience that we don't even have the luxury of right. protesting peacefully. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We we don't even have the luxury of being able to say, "This is wrong." What I'm experiencing. Um, but what I'm very proud to see is that it hasn't stopped us ever. Yeah. It has never stopped us. Yeah. And it has it has brought about significant change. I, I think part of understanding Black history is about studying our resistance, our protests, and our resilience within within that. And that is part of our action. Um, you know, one of my mentors, Dr. Akua Benjamin, always said, resistance is in our DNA as Black mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. We will always resist. Mm -hmm. And I, that, always, that always stays with me. And I also have to check myself. You know, I'm not going to be holier than thou. Um, I, I, I have to check myself when I might be critical of the manner in which people protest. Um, and I, I'm at a point where I have to say, no matter what it might look like to me, maybe it's not the way I would protest. It is a natural response yeah. Yeah. right, to the abnormalities that we have to experience as Black people. Yeah. And if, if Crib Community, if you take away anything from tonight, please, please, please hear those words from, from Dr. Masakori, because I think that that understanding, that real understanding um, of protest really being the expression of pain and grief and trauma uh, that has gone unchecked and unacknowledged for centuries is, is, is really imperative for folks to understand. So thank you for that. Last question. Oh, I'll I could talk to you all night now that, now that we're here. <laughs> but, um, uh, so the acknowledgement of anti-Black racism uh, being rooted in our societal structures has seeped into mainstream collective consciousness, if you will. Um, and at this moment, social media has been a crucial space to facilitate social change, as we've talked about here this evening, and conscious reason. For a few weeks, social media communities mobilized sharing infographics, book lists, and other content about racism and discrimination um, and as the momentum and engagement of this social movement across social media ebbs and it flows, we begin to see the importance of being steadfast. Steadfast in our efforts, our endurance, and we recognize the importance of having both short and long-term strategies, as you alluded to this evening, to tackle and address anti-Black racism. Simply put, becoming knowledgeable about systemic racism is necessary, but not sufficient enough in bringing about meaningful social change to Black communities. So as you talked about these three sort of pronged approach, I think I'm circling back here, and it would be helpful to answering this question. How do we then cement or solidify a global movement of protests for social justice designed to address anti-Black racism and do it through research and through policy and through practice? Well, you know, that, it's the last question, so I have to get my agenda on the table, which is the collection oh. of race-based data. In Canada, we do not collect race-based data. We do not make an effort to understand what the experiences are of Black people engaging in the Canadian systems, no matter what system, education system, child welfare system, the, uh, the, the, the criminal justice system. I can go on and on and on, right? Socioeconomic issues. Um, you know, we have to beg, literally beg, for public health to collect race-based data on COVID. And we saw what was happening in the States. And, you know, we've talked about this already. No matter where we are situated in the diaspora, our health outcomes will be the same. So we were watching what was happening to our Black brothers and sisters in the States during the, the well, still happening with COVID. And Canada was not collecting race-based data. And when they did, what we expected was the result that 
you know, in, in the city that we're located in, 83% of all COVID cases are racialized community members and 21% of the highest rate is in the black community. Um, if we don't know who black people are and what their experiences are in a country, there's, there's nothing we can do in terms of changing that experience. It, it's, it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. It don't right, count, you, it doesn't, we don't count. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and you know what social media has done, I mean, the advent of the internet in general, is create alternative spaces where people can get educated on these issues because they're not going to find that in mainstream systems, especially the, the education system. Um, and, you know, I tweet all the time. Uh, are you allowed to talk about Twitter on Instagram? I, I don't know what the <laughs> protocol is. Listen, this is the Instagram community. You're allowed to talk about whatever <laughs> okay. you'd like to talk about, but yes, you are. Go for it. <laughs> so I'm always, I'm always tweeting, you know, small facts, things that, you know, hey, did you know blah, blah, blah happened in Canada? And this is the experience of black people. And you get so much commentary about I didn't know that. I never got any of that information in school. Um, we're absolutely erased from any understanding of who we are as people who were here from the beginning of the creation of this colonial state called Canada. And... Uh, for me, you know, you asked a very big question, but for me, it, it has to start with that simple acknowledgement that in order for us to show commitment to a community, commitment to Black communities and commitment to Black people, I have to want to know who they are and what their experience is. And if that experience is not a positive one, what am I doing to change that experience for those people that I'm committed to. Um, and you know, this is this is the thing I ask my students if we're gonna be studying anti-black racism or any form of oppression or any community that is marginalized. What's the commitment you're making to that community and what commitment are you making to the people who make up that community? And you know, I think that's that's where I, I would like to start. And I have been on a 21 year crusade to ensure that we start collecting race-based data so we can understand who we are and, and what we're experiencing here in this country. Acknowledge, recognize and appreciate the experience and then be with us to really create systemic change. I hear you loud and clear. Crib community, you heard it here first from Dr. Natisha Masakoy who is, did I say again that you're gonna be doing a postdoc at the crib? I don't, did I mention that? Oh, did I? Yeah, yeah, just a little thing, just a little thing. I, just, I, just I think it kind of starts next week. <laughs> yeah. yeah. With, with this phenomenal, phenomenal Dr. Tanya Sharp, this person I've, I've only heard about. <laughs> no, 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 don't do that, don't do that. But listen, I, I wanted to start this season off with candid conversations about anti-black racism. And I couldn't, I, I can't think of a better person to have on 3830 to, to do some truth telling, to do some truth telling about uh, what it is uh, and the work that needs to be done, the work that still remains to be done and how we need to be strategic about doing it. So I thank you. Um, a professional thank you, but also a personal thank you for you standing in your truth so gracefully, so steadfast and committed. Um, I, I, I just, I just can't thank you enough. I can't thank you enough. So thank you for the, thank you for the opportunity. You are giving us all an opportunity to, to have these conversations. And I think that is going to be the biggest change that comes out of this time that we're in that we're not going back to normal. Yeah. Black people refuse. We're not going back to that normal, which is one of silence and erasure. We're not going back. And we are going to be having these candid conversations. And so thank you. Thank you for giving us that space. And thank you for waiting for me to get the tech. Oh my Sorry about <laughs> I, wait, I was like, we are having her on tonight. We're going to make this happen. And thank, and thank you. you to the community yeah. for sticking it out. 
Crave community, thank you so much for sticking out. You guys are, you guys are the just, just amazing, amazing troopers. And, and that's why we, I love you so very much. But listen, as always, until next week, from our crib to yours, stay safe and keep well. Good night. <laughs>